Hello and welcome back to Chronicle, the history of Newcastle United. I'm Matt Ketchell, the Northeast Football App and Engagement Editor here at Chronicle Live. And this is episode three of our new history series. Episode by episode, we're walking through the history of Newcastle United. Last week, we covered 1892-93. Newcastle East End took over St. James's Park following the demise of West End and unanimously decided to change their name to United. Today for episode three, we're covering 1893 to 1898, a transitional period for the club where they hit the big time, entered the Football League and then reached the promised land of Division One. As ever on this historical podcast journey, I'm joined by Paul Joannou, Newcastle United's official club historian, the ultimate expert in Newcastle United history and the author of some must-reads if you're interested in Newcastle's 140-year-old history. His books Pioneer of, Pioneers of the North, The Huey Gallagher Story, The Ultimate Who's Who and The Ultimate Record all need adding to your reading list. Trust me. So, Paul, this is episode three. We're picking up where we left off, the end of the 1892-93 season, where Newcastle changed their name to United. They're about to fully embrace black and white stripes as their permanent home strips, and the nickname the Magpies is taking off, no pun intended. Tell us about the 1893 off-season, then. It was quite momentous for Newcastle. They accepted an invitation to join the Football League, but at second division level, alongside two other soon-to-be well-known clubs. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, after the club was rejected the previous summer, um, they the tried to enter the Football League uh, 12 months earlier, uh, but they weren't, uh, didn't get enough votes in the election process. Um, they actually succeeded um, in this uh, summer's um, uh, election, uh, along with two other clubs, as you say, uh, and, and they were Liverpool and Arsenal. So three of the clubs, uh, three of the nation's biggest and most traditional football clubs all entered the Football League at the same time. Um, and there was only two divisions then. We, we didn't have a four-division pyramid or, or even now a five-division py pyramid. Uh, it was the first division and the second division and Newcastle were elected to the second division. I see. What can you tell us then about Newcastle's first Football League matches and their debut Football League season itself? Um, well, the first the first game was uh, uh, against Arsenal in London. Uh, now, Arsenal were, were called Woolwich Arsenal then. Uh, they had just changed the name from Royal Arsenal to Woolwich Arsenal. Uh, they didn't play in, in North London. They played in South London at the Manor Ground, which was in Plumstead. Um, and that, in fact, was a new ground. It was the first game at that new ground in, in uh, Plumstead. Um, in Newcastle... Um, were still struggling financially. They, they had a real problem getting to London in the first place. And the directors had to uh, uh, dig deep into the pockets to pay for the real journey uh, down to King's Cross. Uh, and Newcastle travelled through the night in budget class, uh, arriving in London early in the morning, very tired, um, had to travel to South London uh, and play a football match uh, against uh, Arsenal. Um, now, they did pretty well. Uh, they, were, they didn't start very well because there were two goals down. Uh, and obviously, the, the, the weary journey affected them. But they came back after the break and drew 2-2 in front of a 6,000 crowd. So mm -hmm. the very first game uh, was uh, pretty good. Um, and uh, you know, very shortly, uh, three, four weeks later, they played the first game at St. James's Park in the Football League by coincidence, against Arsenal again. Um, and uh, they did very well, they won 6-0. Um, and uh, you know, did pretty well in that very first season. Um, with a late season rally, uh, they won a series of games and finished in fourth place. Not bad, not bad. Were second division football league clubs professional at this point? How were, how were finances faring after the transition from... East End to uh, West End's ground, St James's Park. It must have been a financial risk to go from effectively playing locally with the odd long distance game to travelling around the country to places like Plumstead to play league games. Well, it was. Uh, the second division, uh, first and second division, were, were largely, if not 100%, all professional. Uh, not all clubs were limited companies like Newcastle East End. They were one of the first companies in the country, uh, first clubs in the country to. to um, form a limited company, um, but most clubs, uh, including Newcastle, uh, you know, found it difficult um, to make ends meet. Uh, the travelling uh, from 
uh, the northeast of England to right around the country was a, a huge expense. And the gates at first um, at St James's Park weren't great, but uh, they gradually um, found the feet and finances improved. Was the Football League a step up in class on the pitch for Newcastle then? How did they manage in the first couple of seasons in the new league? Well, it was a, a huge step up um, uh, compared to the Northern League and and uh, the local teams that they, they were playing in the previous years. Um, the first, after that first season, which did they did very well, as I said, 1894-5 uh, was a very difficult season. Um uh, sort of second season syndrome, if you want to call it that. Um, the, the 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 struggled all season, and the the, the recorded the two um, heaviest defeats in the whole history of the club, um, in in well over a hundred years. Uh, the, the fell nine nil to Burton Wanderers, who were a second division club then, uh, when the the two Capes brothers, uh, Art and Andrew, um, uh, were up front for Burton and they rattled in a, a good few goals against Newcastle and that was not all in the FA Cup um, you know Newcastle had started playing in the FA Cup they'd not ve got very far in any season up to then uh, but they played probably the club's biggest match of all time at, up to that point and um, they played Aston Villa who was the country's best side without doubt uh, in the lost 7-1 so that season, they the fell 9-0 and 7-1 in the space of a few months. Yeah, me 9-0. I hope that record's never broken in, in my lifetime. Could they um, be relegated out of the Football League at this point? Obviously, you said there was no pyramid as such, but w what were the consequences of finishing bottom of the uh, old Division 2? Well, at that time, there was no uh, relegation at all from Division 2. Um but uh, the clubs who finished uh, bottom uh, would face a re-election process, and that could be um, very tricky, uh, something of a lottery. Um, so um, luckily, Newcastle never finished uh, in those bottom places um, and didn't have to go through a re-election process. OK, then. So a couple of seasons of consolidation, we can call it, in the Football League. It sounds like they needed to dip into the transfer market to, to fulfil the ambitions that they had is that what happened um yes it, it, it was really um the summer of 1895 uh the club directors decided on a complete revamp of the of the footballing squad and several new faces arrived um, um a few from scotland uh players like willie wardrop uh, malcolm lennox andy aitken who went on to become a, a stalwart player in the next decade uh, and the Scottish international fullback called Bob Foyers all arrived from north of the border. And they also brought in a chap called Jimmy Stott, who was a, a, um, a, a very solid halfback. And all of these players made a big difference. Uh, in Newcastle, uh, you recovered from that disastrous season uh, in the previous 12 months and finished fifth in 1895-96. Uh, Sounds good. Making progress. Who was pulling the strings then off the pitch at this stage and, and making big decisions and scouting players and paying transfer fees? Because obviously clubs didn't have managers as such during this era, did they? Well, not managers as we call them now. Um, uh, Newcastle never had a manager for over 30 years from that point. Uh, um, it was all based upon um, you know, the club was managed by the directors. Uh, they were all part-time, uh, you know, didn't take salaries officially. Um, there were all local uh, prominent uh, people, men like uh, William Nesham, John Cameron, Alex Turnbull at that point. Um, and they also had a full-time club secretary. Um, and he was a chap called Frank Watt. And, and he uh, became a very influential um, personality to Newcastle United um, over the coming uh, decades. Yes, Frank Watt, one of the early personalities uh, associated with the history of, of Newcastle. What can you tell us about Frank then? Anything about his, his style of, of uh, management and organisation? Did he live locally? Was he a Geordie? Why were Newcastle United his project? Because uh, they'd only obviously been in existence about 15 years at this stage. Yeah, well, Frank Watt was, uh, wasn't was a Geordie. Uh, he was born and raised in Edinburgh. Um, 
uh, and he was a very much a pioneer footballer, a trailblazer in in the east of Scotland. He was a player in the 1870s, um, and after uh, that, he, he um, was appointed the very first secretary of the Edinburgh Football Association, and he did much to develop the game in the east of Scotland. Uh, he became a hugely respected administrator uh, in Scotland. Uh, he was a referee in in Scotland. He was also for two or three years one of the on the, on the selection committee of the Scottish national side. Uh, so he was a very established figure in uh, north of the border, uh, and he was in effect uh, chosen by Newcastle United to become their uh, your figurehead uh, in December 1895. He, he was appointed club secretary and at the time you could you know now we would probably say that the club secretary back then was uh, now a chief executive and managing director uh, in the modern um modern terminology um now what became one of the most well-known personalities in football um uh, over the next uh, uh decades um he was a portly gentleman he was uh, cigar smoking and he sported a, a quite magnificent moustache and any yeah. photographs of him from his days at Newcastle United always you could see this uh, uh, magnificent moustache uh, as a prominent feature uh, usually smoking a cigar as I say yeah. now he ran Newcastle United in effect with the, with the directors for 37 years uh, and he was very much responsible for much of the management of the club uh, involved in everything uh, in the way of administration of the club, but also he was also involved in player selection, player uh, purchases, uh, and the club won four championship titles. He, they got the seven cup finals uh, and, uh, before before he died. And his son succeeded him at St. James's Park, and he was at New United for another 18 years thereafter. So a very prominent uh, figure in, in the building of Newcastle United. Amazing, and he'd probably be prominently featured in the next few episodes of our history series if he was had a 37-year association with the club. So look forward to hearing some more about Frank. It looks like attendance tripled during this era, Paul, going from around a gate of around about 4,000 in 1894-95 to up to 12,000 by the time we reach the 1897-98 season. What happened? Well, at last... Um... You know, after the initial struggle financially uh, and, and support being pretty low, uh, the Newcastle public began to get behind the club. Um, and uh, you know, by the time Frank Watt arrived in, in for the opening uh, year of 1896, uh, the focus was now by then on promotion to the top flight. Uh, and, and with it came better gates and better revenue. Um, that was the aim. Um, the financial position improved uh, with an average attendance of eight and a half thousand um, and top gates of 17,000 uh, against uh, Notts County and 16,000 against Newton Heath, um, who are now Manchester United. Um, now, that was uh, by you know, 1896 uh, uh, and the gates were to increase the following year. Mm. So this is now 1897 and it sounds like Newcastle were gearing up for a serious charge for promotion to Division 1. Uh, there were, certainly 1897-98 was, was a, a, a successful season um, uh, and it was a promotion season that they managed to get to the top division. Uh, but as, to, to, as was to be United's way for many years, in, in many instances, they did it the hard way. Um, and that was after more new faces arrived, uh, notably a, a very potent centre forward from Scotland called Jock Peddy, uh, who became a fearsome striker, uh, and two halfbacks who joined Jimmy Stott uh, in the key midfield area, chaps called Tommy Gay and Jack Ostler. And they were, they were very prominent in the successful year that the club had. And there was two Scottish veterans as well who came from Sunderland, um, Johnny Harvey and Johnny Campbell. They were two very uh, talented forwards who helped Newcastle um, get into the promotion places. 
I see. And I assume now the fans are fully on board. No more East End, West End bickering. Was it a case of a healthy crowd and healthy support translating into healthy finances and therefore better fortunes on the pitch? That's right. Uh, support was good in, in, the, in, in the, the divisions of East End and West End uh, by 1897 had been largely forgotten. Um, as the club challenged at the top of the table, uh, attendances now reached an average of over 12,000 um, with a top gate at the capacity of 30,000 uh, when the Met rivals in the, in the promotion race, Burnley. Uh, so, you know, finances were getting better and better uh, and the, the club was developing um, all the way along. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Newcastle did it the hard way when it came to their Division 1 promotion. Can you explain exactly what happened? Well, promotion was very much different back then. Uh, it wasn't automatic. Um, there was a what was called a test match series of games played, um, a sort of play out, playoff system as we would know it now. Um, uh, there was a mini league between the bottom two clubs in the top division and uh, the top two clubs in Division 2. And they had to uh, compete in that uh, four-way challenge. And the four clubs were Stoke and Blackburn, uh, Burnley and Newcastle United. And how did Newcastle get on in this test series? Well, it was uh, they didn't finish in the top two places. Uh, United finished in third position and out of the reckoning. Uh, but it was a controversial uh, test match uh, series. Uh, the final round of matches uh, saw Stoke and Burnley play out a nil-nil draw. Uh, now that draw ensured both clubs were uh, promoted uh, as the top two uh, places in the mini league. Uh, however, there was a huge outcry because those two clubs contrived the re result and, and there was much uh, um, press um, coverage of the game and it was quite clear that uh, the two clubs had no intention of uh, allowing uh, uh, Newcastle or Blackburn uh, the chance of overtaking them. Uh, now, the Football League eventually changed the promotion rules as a result, uh, bringing in, um, or at first they, they decided that something had to happen uh, for Newcastle and Blackburn, who had been uh, severely um, uh, you know, disregarded in, in terms of the promotion race, um, and they, in effect, extended the top division by two clubs. And uh, at the league's annual meeting, uh, Blackburn and United were voted into the, into the top division uh, as, a, as a result. And at the same time, they uh, cancelled the test match um, uh, series of games and eventually brought in and, and, and did bring in automatic promotion. Brilliant. That wrong was righted and they got there in the end. Probably no open top bus celebration through town, but... Newcastle were now officially a Division One club. Uh, they were, they were in the top division, um, and uh, you know it was very much what they wanted because uh, the clubs in the top division uh, were uh, as, at the status that they could attract bigger gates. You know, they joined your know, rival Sunderland, who were at that time uh, rival rivals to Aston Villa as the very best in the country. So um, Newcastle wanted to, um, they were very ambitious with Frank Watt and the directors at the helm. They wanted to uh, match Sunderland as being um, the biggest club in the country. And this was excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's great to hear. And early ambition of the club. Um, this, the Newcastle support has always been noted. For, for loyalty and, and numbers in the 20th century and the 21st century. But is this the moment that it was properly established, do you think? Uh, I think it probably was. Um, you know, the club went from strength to strength after after getting promotion to the top division. Um, and as I said, uh, with the bigger clubs uh, coming to St James's Park, gates uh, dramatically increased uh, towards the end of uh, the century and into the Edwardian era. You know, uh, the club became, um, you know, probably one of the, the very best supported clubs in the country. Uh, very few clubs could um, match them in gates. And uh, as a consequence, finance, 
finances hugely uh, improved and they could attract better and better players. Yes, they finished the Victorian era in style. And as we're going to find out in our next episode, they're going to take that momentum into the Edwardian era. Um, we'll leave it there, Paul. Newcastle have joined the Football League Division 2 and it's taken them five seasons to establish themselves and then gain promotion to Division 1, even if it did happen in unorthodox circumstances. Next week, we leave the Victorian era and enter the Edwardian era, where Newcastle actually win the league. Can you imagine that? But uh, in more familiar circumstances, they lose the FA Cup. So uh, a bit of, bit of normality returning there. Thanks as ever, Paul, for your historical expertise. Listeners, please subscribe to the Everything is Black and White podcast via whichever podcast platform you use. Follow Chronicle Live's Newcastle United channels on social media. We're at Chronicle NUFC on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And keep an eye out for new episodes of Chronicle, the history of Newcastle United every week. If you have a history question about Newcastle, we have the person, the perfect person here to answer that for you. Email those to the EIBW podcast at reachplc.com. I'll pick out some of the best for future shows and we'll put them to Paul and hopefully he can answer them. Thanks so much for listening to Chronicled, the history of Newcastle United. <laughs>